my grandfather came from St. Kitts to the Bronx, and my grandmother came from South Carolina to the Bronx, both as little children. And um, and then, uh, you know, my mother was born there, and my whole, my family is very, very Bronx-centered. <laughs> it's like a part of our identity. I grew up in the, what they call the South Bronx, which is really the West Bronx, but, you know, just technically. Uh, 67th and Anderson, around Jerome Avenue, Kings, like that area. And I also grew up right at the dawn of, uh, at the dawn of hip hop becoming, starting to become more mainstream, right? So it was, you know, Public Enemy, it, it actually even before Public Enemy, it was like right in between the, the like the Melly Mel and all of them in the park and like um, Scott LaRock Harris one coming out and they were from our neighborhood, they were in our neighborhood. So like seeing a lot, Slick Rick, Dougie Fresh, all of them, seeing those people growing up and then as a teenager, like, Hip hop in the '90s is just a big part of my life. Like both my Bronx life and I mean, being from the Bronx and hip hop was a big part of my life. And Public Enemy coming out was sort of the marriage of what I loved, um, which was hip hop and like you know being from New York, but also social justice, which is which I had started. I was heavily involved in from an early teenage years. Um, and so, yeah, I was always like really moved by this thinking early on about hip hop as an organizing tool, particularly, you know, like the public enemies or poor righteous teachers or even tribe and some of the ways, you know, some of the ways and they told stories and the ways that not even just told stories, but they presented an alternative for blackness (laughs) for us early on. And so, um, yeah, I started doing social justice work. I come from a family that's very, very, very black, very black. Um, it means we had birthday cakes on Malcolm X's birthday. It means I couldn't wear red, combinations of red, white, and blue. Um, like, my mother would be like, what are you, a flag? Like, you know, like, it was just, we was just extra black. It means that my grandfather used to pick me up on the weekends, and we would drive to 125th Street. It was a, This is when they had record stores, and there was a place called Harlem Music Hut that you could get all your mixtapes from, like your Kid Capri, your Ron, all of that kind of stuff. But also they had cassettes of... Um, elder um, scholars, so you can go and get uh, John Henry Clark on tape, a lecture from John Henry Clark or Dr. Ben Joseph or stuff like that. And he would go, he would buy a cassette, and we would drive around listening to whatever lecture, some John Henry Clark on tape. It was, we was black like that. <laughs> and when I was in the seventh grade, my grandfather, I was in Catholic school, and I was, I was only in Catholic school because it was like where working class parents put their kids when they didn't want them to go to public school, but they couldn't afford really expensive private schools. It was not. But I became Catholic. And so I guess my my family believed in, like, sort of letting you find your own way. But around the seventh grade, my grandfather, after I made my confirmation, he was like, enough of this. <laughs> He's like, enough of this, Catholic. So he started telling me about how Catholics had slaves. And he was like, you know, it's these it's these, it's these white folks running behind G talking about Jesus that got us enslaved and, and started giving me books to read. Like, first he started with Roots, which was mild. Then he went to, like, Before the Mayflower. And they came before Columbus. And heavy hitting books in the seventh grade. And I was like, <laughs> how you trying to destroy my life? Like, what I understand to be, you know, the way the world works. And um, so from seventh grade on, I was... I, I appreciate what he did, but I also wish... It had been done differently because then I went through a period of, like, anger. You know, I just went through an extra, like, oh, they lied, they're, you know, that kind of thing. And that carried me almost halfway through high school. And then I saw, and then I found in high school a way to take that feeling and and make that work, become work. So when I discovered um, this organization, 21st Century Youth Leadership Movement, is I joined them at 14. When I got in 21st century, it became a way to take all of this, like, knowledge and, like, cultural awareness and historic awareness my family gave me and put it into action. So they helped me identify and understand what injustice and justice looked like, you know. And my mother was also deeply, she never uses the word feminist, but I was raised, I, I knew the words to for colored girls by the time I was 12 years old because we used to listen to the Broadway recording in the house. So, you know, my mother... Um, Audrey Lord was a teacher, which had a, a class with her when she was in college. And so, she, you know, I was surrounded by Maya Angelou and, so, and all of these black feminist writers. So I had all of that. But until I discovered 
21st century, I didn't know how to take that and actionize that. That was really the shift. There's this, there was this dominant narrative that was very easy to take up, right? Like I remember in the sixth and seventh grade loving history and loving American history and this idea that, um, that you know, the, the forefathers came and built this country and they've got all of this kind of Plymouth Rock, all of that kind of stuff and learning about the Constitution. And I used to know the preamble of the Constitution. Like, you know, it just I was so into that and I thought just it just is a great story. Right. Like just in general, I was drawn to the story of America and and how we came to be, even though I knew about slavery and I knew about um, how we were enslaved. There was still something that was attractive about the America story until my grandfather, what he did with with introducing me to these different narratives would start peeling away at that. And he and, and he would I mean, he would say stuff directly, but more so he would be like, read this. And I'd come home and I'd like, oh, I learned this, this, that, and this. Because he always like, what you learned in school? And I'd be like, oh, this, this, and that. And, that. and I remember when I recited the preamble to the Constitution to him, and he was appalled. <laughs> and that's when he gave me, they came before Columbus. And he was like, you need to read this. That's cute. I'm glad you know that. I hope you get an A in history. <laughs> but you need to read this. And so when, as I was introduced on my own to these to these different narratives, I started to understand, the, first of all, the complexity of what it is to be American and what America was. And and then the truth, right? Like the truth and also this idea that truth is not just truth. It's truth is based on who you are and who's telling it and how it's being told and when it's being told and who it's being told to. And so I didn't realize that we had it, our own, black people had our own truth of what it was to be American and what it was to be in America. And so that that understanding made me confused. It made me angry, um, or trying to grapple with that, right? And then, um, and then when I was introduced to this idea that we, you don't just have to read about oppression, right? You don't just have to study and look and and see it and be angry about it. That you can be, you can be active, you can be out here. And and the premise of twenty first century the organization was to to continue the legacy of the civil rights movement, Black Power movement, labor movement in a new generation and when I was introduced to those narratives it was like these kids are my age these kids crossing the you know marching in the marches and and getting holes and doing all they were basically my age and so once I saw that I was like oh we we shape history our truth has always been weaponized against us and I think the way that you the way that you push back against these other false narratives is to to use to weaponize it for us and and it's also it's sort of what I'm dealing with now in this around the Me Too movement is that people keep saying, "Oh, the white people are taking it from you. Oh, the white people are co-opting. Oh, the Me Too movement is not for us. It's for white people." And I'm like, "Here's a thing that you know is true, right? You you have a person here who said this person founded this thing, or this person started this, or started doing this work, or what have you. You know that's true. How can it also then be true that it's not for us?" And so I'll continue to hold it up and say, this is for us. This is true that it's for us. They're going to keep holding it up and saying whatever they say, do, doing whatever they want to do with it, talking about the movement in different ways. Go, you know, white people, I mean, are gonna, or non-black people are going to go and, and do whatever they want to do. It doesn't matter. We stay so focused on what they're doing as opposed to what we, the power that we have. And we just give our power over. I feel like if we... If we teach our children and teach each other to stop relinquishing our power, it is what we say it is. This is powerful because I said it's powerful. And it doesn't matter what somebody else is saying, right? We just give too much to them. I feel like we give too much energy and too much power to what they think. And we start from the premise that white people said, I don't, that's not, that's not how my world works.